Hi everyone, my name is Dean Wampler from AnyScale, and today I'm going to talk to you about Ray, an enterprise-grade library for writing distributed Python applications. We'd like to get your feedback on the talk and the conference in general, so please make sure you rate the sessions. I'd love to hear your thoughts about this. So here's the agenda. I'm going to discuss you know, why Ray exists, why, did, why was it created, and what problems does it solve. Uh, I'll go through a, a demo to show you what it's like to work with Ray and how to integrate it with Spark, or one way to do it anyway. Uh, and then I'll finish with some thoughts about when you want to use Spark versus when you want to use Ray, uh, and then a few thoughts about how to get started with, with Ray. All right, first, let's talk about why Ray. And this is our little Ray icon. So it, it really came about in response to a couple of big trends we've been observing the last you know, five, six years, whatever, in, in our industry. The first is that uh, machine learning model sizes, especially for neural networks, have been growing enormously. You know, basically, if more, Moore's law is growing at 2x every 18 months. Uh, these model sizes have been growing at a factor of 35 times every, two, or every 18 months. Uh, and that's just obviously outstripping Moore's law. So we have to go distributed if we're going to be able to uh, you know, keep up and, and have reasonable you know, times and performance and all that. At the same time, you know, Python has just uh, grown enormously as it's become kind of the de facto language for data science, including machine learning. And, and you know, the two things together kind of made it necessary for us to have a robust, easy to use way of doing distributed Python especially for people who don't want to have to think about distributed computing. They just want something relatively intuitive that does you know, the vast majority of what they need to do without a lot of you know, special handholding or whatever. So let me talk about, in particular, the challenges of doing reinforcement learning, which is really the, bigger, uh, the biggest motivator for Ray. Uh, although it's a general purpose framework, uh, reinforcement learning was really kind of what drove uh, the creation of it. Uh, if you don't know what uh, reinforcement learning is, here's sort of the gist of it. So you have some sort of environment and an agent that's trying to work its way through the environment to make intelligent decisions and maximize its reward. So it's going to be observing the state of the environment, observing the reward, uh, the, the short-term reward it received after its last decision and the action it took. And then it will try to make a new uh, decision, take a new action that will, over time, maximize the cumulative reward. And that's the whole idea with reinforcement learning. But it became really famous a few years ago when uh, the, the DeepMind team from Google successfully beat the world's best Go player using uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, Lee Seedall was his name. Uh, this was considered a holy grail in a lot of ways. It, it, the reason is that the game space, you know, the possible moves and, and the state they can take you in is enormous in Go. It's actually much bigger than chess. So it was seen as a holy grail, something that people didn't expect to be doable for a long time. And yet it was done a few years ago with uh, so-called deep reinforcement learning. And it sort of looked like this. They had a neural network behind the scenes that learned you know, key structures of the board and key moves that had maximal advantage. And you're going back to that original diagram of reinforcement learning. In this case, your observations are the board state. The actions are where you're going to place stones. And the rewards are pretty simple. Either you win or lose. And zooming into this a little bit, you can see it's a fairly involved neural network with a lot of different kinds of layers. And in fact, one of the challenges is finding the optimal architecture and then you know, training it to do, do its job. So going back to the motivation for Ray, <clears throat> so we have this uh, a number of things going on here. We have a simulator that is just sort of an arbitrary uh, application uh, with arbitrary CPU access patterns and memory access patterns. It could be a game simulator. If you're training a robot or a factory floor, it could be simulators for that. These things are very general purpose kind of compute problems, but they need to be run a lot because you're going to be training a lot and they need to be efficient. And the agent itself could also be somewhat you know, complex. At the same time, you've got this sort of traditional neural network stuff. We have a lot of tools for that, like PyTorch and TensorFlow. You'd like a system that integrates with those tools uh, rather than just rewrite that from scratch. 
And in reinforcement learning, like most machine learning systems, you're going to be training a lot. You know, in the case of uh, reinforcement learning, you'll be playing these games over and over and over again to try to achieve the maximal cumulative reward. So you need this to be very efficient. You need to run it over a cluster to, you know, not take forever. Uh, and it just uh, creates a, in combination with all these things, a lot of demand for very flexible compute from small scale to large scale. Uh, lots of flexibility is required for this to be optimal. And that was sort of what drove the creation of Ray. So let's talk about the ecosystem a little bit. So most of you may not actually ever use Ray. You may use one of these libraries on top of Ray, which implements you know, uh, support for one of these you know, typical scenarios that you have to do in, in a machine learning ecosystem whether it's hyperparameter tuning or distributed training or serving models. Uh, and we just talked about uh, the, the very first library, which was RLlib you know, for reinforcement learning. You may have to dip down into the Ray API, for example, to program your game simulators or something. But in a lot of cases, you don't need to drop to that level. So you kind of you know, pick the level that you need uh, and then you know, work with it. And finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about even using this uh, for microservices and, and the a view that we have about how it can really help build applications and run them. So, you know, microservices were created for a lot of reasons. They have a lot of benefits that I won't go into, but they have a couple of challenges. And in particular, I want to mention this idea that um, when you're actually deploying these things, you're going to be spinning up an arbitrary number of instances of a microservice. And you do that for a couple of reasons. One is to achieve scalability beyond what a single node can give you, but also to give you resilience in case a node crashes. But all of this stuff has to be managed explicitly, and it's a bit of a challenge. And in fact, it's led to some blowback against the whole idea of microservices because it can be challenging to run these things. Well, one of the great things about Ray is that it actually lets you go back to the simplicity of having one logical instance for each microservice, but behind the scenes, Ray is scaling transparently your, your uh, compute over a cluster. You know, you're getting the resiliency of being across a cluster as well as the scalability of not having single node boundaries. So we think this is a really nice way that Ray uh, supports general development as well as the specific cases of various machine learning problems. Okay, let me uh, demo this a little bit for you. This demo, we'll see how to use Ray in PySpark, or at least one way that you can do it. Uh, this is part of my talk for uh, Spark plus AI Summit 2020. Uh, the advantages of the way we're going to do this, we're actually going to embed Spark into uh, a UDF for PySpark. The advantages being that we avoid the overhead of uh, HTTP and other RESTful calls. Uh, sometimes it's better to decouple your services like that uh, just for you know, the usual DevOps reasons, but other times you might want the greater efficiency of having uh, the code co-resident in your UDF. Uh, when possible, even though in, in the case of, of both Spark and Ray, it might be running over a cluster and there may be some communications across nodes. Hopefully it'll be optimized uh, in various ways that are a little harder to do when you have discrete uh, hard-coded services, as it were. Uh, again, the disadvantage being uh, you know, coupling code together more tightly than you'd have in a service. Anyway, you can find out more about Ray at uh, this link at uh, it's ray.io. And what I've done actually is I've started a Ray cluster with this command uh, Ray start uh, dash dash head, and I'm going to connect to it uh, and run a little Spark job here. So let's evaluate these notebook cells. First, we need to make sure that we have Java 8 running. Sure enough, uh, we'll do some imports, including PySpark and Ray, uh, import some types from the PySpark SQL API, although we don't actually need all of these. Uh, and then we're actually going to define a UDF. Uh, the, so the, the sample app that I'm going to demonstrate is uh, sort of a simple approach to data governance. Data governance is a big topic. It's really about you know managing the lineage and legacy of data, who's seen it, uh, who has access to it, uh, what transformations have been done on it, you know, all kinds of stuff. And what we're going to focus on is just one little use case, which is I want to record the IDs of every record that I've seen in this job, uh, for basically for auditing purposes. So we have a little... Um, Python class, and I'll explain the Ray remote annotation in a moment, but um, it's, we call it pretentiously data governance service. This could be a hook that actually talks to something like Apache Atlas or whatever. 
Um, the main API method is going to be log, where I'll, I'll call this to log these uh, record IDs. Uh, I'll have methods here to, to get the IDs, to get the count of them, to reset the list, and to you know, measure time that the system's been running. Um, now, the, the Ray Remote Decorator actually will turn this from a normal Python class into something we call a Ray Actor, which is a stateful thing that is going to be running somewhere in the cluster, and we can make remote calls to it. So this is Ray's way of handling distributed state, is to have actors uh, encapsulate that state. And if you don't need, uh, if you just need functions that don't have to have any state uh, attached to them, we can do that too with the same decorator, Ray Remote, and those are called tasks. Uh, I also do need these uh, get IDs and get count methods because once this thing's an actor, I can't just reach in and read fields in the class. I have to actually have getter methods for that. So. That's what this is for. Uh, it's mostly just a, a wrapper around a dictionary, or, or sorry, a list. Okay, now let's define a basic record type. And all this really is gonna be is just a, a thing that has an ID and then some opaque data set that we'll use. So we'll use this as just a, a tool for the demo. And now we're gonna initialize Ray inside our application here. It's already running as a cluster. Basically, we're attaching to it. This is sort of the analog of creating a Spark context or, or Spark session. Uh, the address equals uh, zero, or sorry, equals auto says connect to the cluster. I got this little warning because I've actually run this notebook already. That's what the ignore reinit error is about. It's just, you know, don't make a big deal about it. Just uh, uh, keep going. And there's this convenience tool called the dashboard. If I click into that, then I can see that I've got several tasks already running. If this were in a cluster, this could be hundreds of them around the cluster. Uh, and I can use this, I won't show it anymore, but I could use this to see how things are performing, to profile things and so forth. All right, back to um, the notebook. So now we're gonna create something called a detached actor. This is sort of like a name service, something that I can reach out and ask the system to tell me, or give me a hook to it without me having to retain a, a reference to it in my Python code. Uh, this would be convenient for our UDFs where we're gonna kind of be you know, running across a cluster, completely decoupled from this particular notebook. We need to be able to get at this object that's out there. So we're gonna create a named detached actor. Um, and I have this little logic here to check if it's already created. And if so, then uh, don't try again. Uh, and sure enough, we've already got this, uh, this thing registered. So we can just go on. And just as a test, we'll go ahead and try it out. We'll use this method called ReUtil get actor to retrieve it, and then we'll write a few records to it. That's succeeded, and I have this little helper function that we can use to see what the status is. And sure enough, we have a bunch of them. Actually, we have uh, more than three from a previous run, but we're about to reset that. So if I reset it, so we're back to zero. So we have a clean slate, we can start over. Now here's the function that'll actually be a UDF. And what this is going to do is first, it will basically do the same initialization, initialization we just did in the local task that's running for you know, whatever partition a Spark has assigned to this particular process. So we'll initialize Ray if we need to. We'll only have to do this once. Uh, and then we'll do the same trick of uh, you know, asking Ray for the actor and then logging the ID for it. Uh, and there's this one method in here. You'll see Ray.get, uh, second to the last line. It, it turns out when you call uh, something.remote, which is how we've been you know, logging these methods, it actually is an asynchronous process. It just uh, it returns a handle, a future that you can use to get the value later. If you just want it run asynchronously and you know, fire and forget, you can just move on and you won't be blocked waiting for it to complete. In this case, we want to make sure that it worked. So we'll actually do ray.get, which blocks until the result is returned from that actor call. Uh, and that's what we're going to do. So dgs.log, that's the method that logs these IDs. Adding the dot .remote is necessary because it's an actor now. And then ray.get will retrieve, uh, well, it actually returns the current count. And this is something that will return uh, as part of our um, UDF. Okay, now we'll do the usual Spark stuff. We'll initialize Spark. Um, we'll create our UDF. Uh, we're going to return a map type. Uh, recall that the log record returns a string, whether or not it's successfully initialized. Uh, actually, it's returning a, 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 a dictionary, and that will turn into a JSON object, which just gets mapped to this map type with a string that's the key, and then the integer, which is the value. Okay, so let's write 50 records to this thing. We'll create a data frame from those records. 
and then we'll actually run a query that returns you know, the same uh, fields, but also now calls this UDF, and we'll alias that to be a new field called logged. So here's our new schema. And now here's, here's the result. So you can see that uh, we've successfully added things asynchronously. Notice that the, uh, the counts are not uh, in, in order. That's because we're actually running at least three of these uh, parallel tasks. We can tell it's three because we initialize three times here and here, but only had to do it once. And then the rest of the data was written. Um, so it worked. And we can check to see what the status is. We now have 50 records like we would expect. We can reset. And then we can, uh, this is optional, whenever the driver process, as it's called, exits, like we close the notebook and shut it down, Ray's automatically shut down, or at least the local connection to the Ray cluster, but we could do that explicitly here. Okay, that's it. Okay, we saw a little bit about how to use Ray uh, with a, you know, an actual demo. Uh, one, one possible way you could integrate it with Spark you know, let me finish talking a little bit about uh, the strengths of Spark versus the strengths of Ray and when you would use one or the other. Well, I'm speaking to the uh, choir here, as, as it were. You know, all of you know that Spark is really amazing for massive data set problems, especially when you have uniform records with the schema. And even when you're doing things like neural or um, natural language processing with so-called unstructured data, you almost immediately transform it into structure of some kind. And uh, Spark is just really great for this kind of efficient, parallelized transformations and analysis of data. It has a wonderful SQL API on top for people that don't want to think about lower level programming. It's great for uh, doing this kind of analytics in a batch mode as well as you know, in stream processing. Uh, and it gives you really uh, intuitive higher level abstractions for all kinds of data science and engineering tasks. So it's really, you know, it's famous because it's really great at what it does. But I mentioned that Ray emerged to solve some kind of new emerging problems. And these are the things where we think Ray excels, highly non-uniform graphs of either data or compute. So you can think about you know, a typical object model. If you're writing an application, you have this graph of structures uh, that are all uh, you know, sort of arbitrarily put together that need to, in this case, be distributed though over a cluster yet still accessible. And you have to be able to handle this distributed state intuitively. Ray tries to do that, as we saw with uh, you know, Python classes. And also the compute that you might be doing, it can also be highly non-uniform and highly distributed. Everything from small tasks to very large compute intensive tasks over different kinds of resources. We think that Ray uh, provides a really intuitive API for you know, the 90 to 95% of cases where you don't need really tight control over this kind of uh, you know, non-uniform, highly distributed computation. You just want something that's reasonably intuitive that extends concepts you already understand from Python and then lets you work with them as you normally would, but now running in a distributed case. And as we saw and discussed earlier, it's really good for the sort of amorphous computation that you might need to do that you know, complements the capabilities of Spark. And so that's where some of these libraries emerged, like our libraries for reinforcement learning, hyperparameter optimization, stochastic gradient descent, and so forth. So if you want to get started with Ray, there's a few resources to check out. Uh, first, if you're already using some of these uh, libraries that are popular in the Python world for either multi-threading or multi-process on a single node, like async IO, job lib, and multi-processing pool, Ray has some drop-in replacements that either integrate with these or replace them so that you now can break the one node boundary but continue to use uh, software that you're used to using. And usually this just involves a single change to an import statement, something like this for the multi-processing pool case. If you want to learn more about Ray, go to ray.io. You can find links to the documentation, examples, uh, tutorials that I've been developing. In fact, those tutorials are starting to be rolled out at uh, anyscale.com slash academy. Uh, you can actually see the Ray source code on GitHub if you want. And we've also got a bunch of events uh, about uh, Ray topics and machine learning this summer. If you'd like to check out those at anyscale.com slash events. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, please. Uh, provide feedback to let me know uh, how you thought about this talk and I hope to see you in the right community.